My name's Mustafa. What's yours? We will escort you to your port of emigration. I'm gonna miss him too. Look, it's the poet! Mustafa? Is he free? You bring a riot to our doorstep. Where are you taking him? Nothing less than a call to rebellion. They think I'm their prisoner, but I've flown away many times. Work is not it's and takes not from itself. Love possesses not, nor will it be possessed. For love is enough. What would I have left if I disavowed all that I believe? You should say, I am in the Thanks, everybody. Sat on the microphone. <laughs> we got you. We got you, Selma. <laughs> um, congratulations. I know this is a project that was years in the making for you, that it wasn't easy to get off the ground. Um, you know, you've, only, you've produced uh, Ugly or Betty. Or keep on the ground. Or keep on the ground. <laughs> and you have, you know, you've produced Ugly Betty, you've produced Frida, and you've produced this. Though These two movies are not easy projects, so why as a producer have you chosen two very difficult projects to get made. Three very difficult projects to, to get made. I guess I'm one of those people that don't fit in anybody's box. And I think there are millions of us out there. So the things that I come up with or that I want to see are not uh, what's out there. Anyway, if it's already out there, why would I want to go through the trouble? It's a, I really detest producing. Unless it's really something that speaks to my heart and that I want to say. And when things are personal, somebody really wants to say something instead of somebody wants to figure out what is it that you're going to pay me to give you, they usually are unique and we live in an industry that claims that it's an industry of imagination, you know, cinema, television. But it really, it's a machine that does not celebrate imagi imagination for the most and that it's terrified of imagination. That's so interesting. I mean, the industry, like you said, we sell it as imagination, but it is an industry, so therefore it is bottom line driven. So what happens for someone who gets into the industry to express themselves and to deal in imagination rather than in bottom line numbers? Well, the, the first thing that happens personally is that, you know, you have a vision of something, you get excited, and then people start like, oh, I don't know, that's really, you know. And then the process is like, you're, you're thinking, oh, well, maybe this is really not a good idea. And you, you start putting yourself down. And then there's always that beautiful angel that says, you can never get this done. And all of a sudden, there's like an injection of adrenaline oh, yeah. that makes me want to prove them wrong. You get that, you get that versus mentality. Yes. <laughs> now I've got this an enemy is, on this one. This is what gives me all the energy to fight for years and every door that shuts, I keep pounding on it until somebody opens and I go through that and find the other one. I'm kind of tired of doing that. I hope the next time after three <laughs> times doing it, people believe a little bit more on my visions. So with a movie like this, you know, you, I know that you were inspired because your, your grandfather is Lebanese, right? And this is a book that he read a lot to you and you think about him when you, when you think of this book, correct? 50% correct. Oh, I hope I didn't get any, I hope <laughs> no, I didn't. It was pretty good. <laughs> oh, um, <no. laughs> No, the, 
That's not what inspired me to make the movie. I have a personal relationship with the book. Oh, good. I got countries right and yeah. the family members Lebanese, right. Lebanese, oh, okay, it is my grandfather, but he didn't read it to me. My grand, Actually, he never read anything to me now that you mention it. Not that I can remember. But um, he had the book on his bedside table, and we were very close, and he died when I was six. So... I really wish he had stayed with me, you know, to teach me about life so that I could get to know him better. He did teach me one thing about life, which is death, because he was the first person that was close to me that died. And I really don't think that you start pondering about what is life and the mystery of it or until you confront death that close. But when I was about 18 years old, I found the book again, and I recognized the cover from my grandfather's bedside table, and I read it. And when I read this book, I felt like it was my grandfather coming to me and teaching me about life through this book and about who he was. Because for those of you who don't know the book, it's really not a story. It's a very sim simple storyline, almost non-existent. It's a series of poems, correct? It's just a series of philosophical poems, and they're very simple. They're about, li you know, they're about the simple things like life or children or uh, good and evil, crime and punishment, on friendship, on talking. So it was my grandfather teaching me about this. Simple, but the most important things, really, in, in life. So when, you, when this becomes a passion project for you, when did you decide that you were going to get a lot of different animators and directors together to make it, that it was going to be a celebration of the form rather than just of this story? Yes, not because a book is personal to you. That means it would make a good movie. And this is why I, was, I wanted to make the difference. Until I got this idea to make a movie that was an experiment an ex and an experience that had never been done before, um, I didn't want to make it into a movie. And let me see. There's a lot. It's a very big question. Let me try to, to, to say it as brief as possible. But brace yourselves. <laughs> Um, going back to the simple things in life, I wanted to make a film that was for human beings, for the human part inside of us, that it's so rarely addressed. And the, this book was perfect because it is a book that has sold more than 120 million copies around the world. It was written by an Arab man, yet it unites all religions different generations, uh, different countries, different creeds. And because, I think it's because about, it, it talks about the simple things in life, death, love, children, that brings us all together. And when you read this book, something really strange happens because it, you hear things and you go, oh, I recognize that. Not because your brain goes back and files it and says, oh, I heard it before here. But because your soul recognizes it as the truth. It's almost, it talks to your instincts. And that's why even many people from different religions, there are many things in the book that talks to all of them. Because it, go, it goes to that, in a simple way to that part of you. But... To make it into a movie, and I wanted all human beings to see it, from three to 103, how do you transform the message and make it come to life? And I thought that, anim the, all of us thought that animation was the right vehicle. Um, because art is limitless. So we could take the poetry and turn it into beautiful art pieces. But nobody wants to just go see, imagine 10, 13, you know, poems that are very beautiful. So we created a simple story, frame story, framing story, that it, 
It was very friendly for all the kids, and it hooked them into it. And for the adults, it gave them permission to be kids again, so that you could take all the beautiful um, li words and art with a light heart. It was very important not to be preachy, not to be boring. And this is why we decided to make it into animation, also because the film is about freedom. And, uh, when it, 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 and it talks about how we are not just body, that we are a lot more than our body, that we are spirit. So I didn't want a bunch of bodies trying to talk about freedom. I wanted people to experience freedom and get out of their body, you know? You mentioned how this was written by uh, an Arab man, and you know, you're trying to touch the human element in all of us. How important for you was it to tell the, a story written by an Arab man that touches the human form in all of us, but in the form of movies, which is so Western-influenced, and rarely do we get to hear the stories of Arabs. I mean, you speak Arabic, right? Your grandfather is Lebanese, but oh, you do not? 50% right, again. <laughs> This is, that's not bad. That's not bad, I gotta say. I've been on five questions and two of them are 50%. So I'm, I'm rolling okay here. I'm curious how important it is uh, for you or if you were aware of this while you're making the film that you're telling a universal story that is written by an Arab, which in the form of movies which are so westernly influenced, how rare it is that we get that kind of story uh, from an Arab person in Western film. Right, and also, you are absolutely right, and also, uh, the film is also about community coming together, not judging, um, not uh, discriminating. Not so. I think that it's all it all goes together very well because um, we have so many preconceived notions of you know the Arab world, and we're terrified of it, and there's a lot of things that we don't know. I mean, here's a man that is an Arab man in 1923, through the, in these poems, when he talks about marriage, he talks about equality. He talks about coming together, but each other keeping their own ground and their own life and their own personality, you know, and uh, two pillars of a temple holding the temple together. But the two pillars obviously have to be uh, equal, equally strong, Arab, 1923, you know? And so there is a lot of things that will surprise you. And like I said, imagine this philosophy coming from an Arab man, but that really brings the religions, I mean, all different religions read this book and they're comfortable with it. This is very rare because it is spiritual and it is philosophical. Well, we so often forget, like you said, we put things in boxes. We so often forget that the basic teachings of most religions are universal truths for all human beings. They're not as uh, sort of categorically box oriented as we as we place them as we place them now. Um, we have a wait. So did I go from fifty percent to hundred percent on that question? One hundred and twenty. Yes, thank you. Uh, let's take another look at a clip uh, from the movie. I believe this clip represents love, or it discusses love, right? Let's take a look at that clip, guys. should say I am in the high of God You cannot direct the course of love If love it finds a way Directs a all course To wake at dawn With a winged heart To come home in the evening With gratitude Then to sleep It looks incredible. It looks absolutely incredible. How did you, how, uh, you and uh, Roger, right, who's the, the, the main director of the entire piece, but had several different animators. How did you go about choosing these animators? Did they pitch you ideas and you guys took that and thought about it? Or did you choose the animators first and then just kind of let them have freedom? No, uh, the, the task was, again, like to make a film that 
the making of the film had the same philosophy as the film itself. So the animators were chosen by their talent, but also to make sure that there were different religions, different uh, ages, different countries. Uh, we did not want the source to have only one perspective. We did not want to dictate what you were supposed to feel in this film. We wanted to make it a world experience. Also, the money comes from different parts of the world. It was done simultaneously in different parts of the world. So the animators then, because the film is about freedom, had absolute freedom in the poems. Sometimes we told them what poems, because we needed specific poems for the, for the story. Some got to choose. Towards the end, it's like, we have two left, you know? Uh, but once they had the poem, we did give them a budget because unfortunately there was no, no, not a lot of freedom in this department. <laughs> when you try to make a film like this, we, we were very poor and I am very blessed that we were because when you don't have a lot of money to throw at people, they do it from the heart. And when they don't have a lot of money to just do whatever they want with it, they have to go deeper into their imagination to, to express themselves. So I, I see it as a blessing, although I, I would love to have, some, to have one television spot or something like that right now, but it's okay. But so it, they were completely free. They, they didn't have to use a specific color palette even. They didn't even have to use one technique of animation. There's different techniques of animation. So they had complete freedom. And actually, that goes further into the audience because the first thing that you need to free you, yourself from, it's yourself. Because you don't know when are they coming or what they're going to look like, you're not controlling, oh, I know, and now this is going to happen or that. You are sort of like, not, not really knowing what's going to happen, and that allows us to take you into each time a completely different journey that it's a visual exuberance uh, and with beautiful words and amazing music, every time completely different. But each time the destination is the same. The destination is the journey is inside of you. And this is why the reaction when people f see the film, I've never seen that many contradictions with people that review it. Uh, everybody experiences, it's, it's a personal experience and very different. There's one that says, definitely the best part was this. Definitely the best part was, and somebody says, a completely different one. So it's a very personal experience. Even the ones that, there was one, that gave us a bad review, and he said, eh, no, 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 this film, it's like a self-help fantasia. I want to use it, if I had the television spot, That's I'd use the bad review to, to, to sell the film. Fantasia is amazing, and self-help is not bad either. I like know, we had another bad one. This is, it's been fascinating to read them, they're so different. We have another bad one that said, oh no, this book, it, it's always been overrated, just like the little prince who's also been overrated, the prophet and the little, who wants to read those books. And then they have this soapy voice of Liam Neeson. This is a critic who has no children and does not know what it's like to like th look through the wondrous eyes of children or anything. This it's is a critic. a critic that has no taste. Yes. <laughs> that too, that too. Uh, you, you know, you've spoken a lot and you've, you've, you said a little bit about trying to get this done. It's really difficult. You have to go outside of Hollywood. Have you found over the years, you know, you've said that Hollywood doesn't want you. You've kind of been quoted as saying that you feel like Hollywood doesn't want you. Do you think that's because you take on really difficult projects that are very personal to you, or do you feel like it's because of different reasons? Who cares? Fair enough. Fair enough. I'm going to sit. Oh my God, Hollywood doesn't want me. What am I going to do? No. Hollywood doesn't want me great. 
Good, because then controversy is your best teacher. Controversy, no. I'm sorry I haven't slept in like five days. <laughs> Adversity. <laughs> controversy could be a great teacher too now that we talk about it, but adversity is your great teacher. If they had been sending me all the great scripts with the big parts, I would have been busy just doing those, and then I wouldn't have had to learn how to produce them myself or direct them. I wouldn't have had the time. I would have been too busy, you know, working in the Hollywood movies to get depressed and figure out my, this is my motto in life. I do not give myself permission to whine about anything that I didn't try to change, that I didn't make an effort to transform or make it into a positive thing. Absolutely. So the things that I've complained about, and I do complain a lot of things constantly because I, I am a complainer by heart, but I work hard at them. You know, equality for men and women, you know, women's rights, children, you know, rights. Uh, I do complain, but I don't just do, let's do, uh, let's create awareness. No, no, no. I do work very hard on those things. No jobs for women in, in Hollywood. Ugly Betty, Frida, this one. It's about women. This one's about a little girl trying to find her own voice. Um, ugly, I mean, you, ugly Betty, you've seen it. If you, don't, if you didn't see it, go find it. Frida, if you didn't see it, you cannot die without watching this film. Is that but it was the, it's what, the courage to be unique, and this is not just for women. So. Is that partly what inspired you to become a producer, was to give jobs to, to more women, to tell more stories about women that you didn't feel like, I mean, obviously those scripts aren't going to come to you, so you have to shepherd them into the light yourself. And Latino, and Latino women, of course. That's it. Not, and, and, and also, you know, it was that, that was a big one. I mean, as you can see, the first, the, the second thing I produced was not for me was to try to find someone else that was not the person that everybody is casting. Ugly Betty is the name of the show. <laughs> really, do you think the person that was going to do that was going to be the person that you see in all the television shows and the magazines? No. I wanted to find ugly, beautiful Betty. And, but also, to, to give parts to others and work for others, but also to have my own voice. Do you feel like uh, La Latinos are misrepresented in Hollywood and it takes people like you, it takes people like America Ferrer to sort of step up and tell uh, personal stories? We are 25% of the moviegoers that repeat and are like really hardcore moviegoers. 25% of it is Latinos. We only represent 4% of the speaking roles that even if we just say, dude, or who killed the president? I, you know? Even if it's like I, I did, or I, because they don't speak English well, I. Even if th that's counted in that 4% of, of uh, the Latino presence in, the, in, a, in a business that we keep alive, by 25% of it. I think it's time to take some uh, questions from the audience. I think we've got a, a number of them right here. Hi, we have a question from a viewer named Tamaris. Um, the viewer is wondering, did you ever question if the movie wasn't going to work? If so, how did you stay motivated? I still question, is the movie going to work? Because it's very hard to know how to tell people that it exists when you don't have not only the money to tell the people that it exists, but there is not mar it do marketing strategies for uplifting spiritual movies have not been developed. They don't exist because these kind of movies do not exist. This is the kind of movie that gives the power back to you. It doesn't try to figure out what you want or, you know, it just gives you inspiration. The movie, you make it. Uh, and who's, 
they don't know how to market. We don't know where to go. What is the outlet that is going to embrace that? So the only way this film can survive is if you make an effort to go see it. And I promise you, you will never get the full experience of this experiment that it's really an experience if you don't see it on the big screen. But it's, it's really going to depend on the word of mouth. So I still ask myself this question, is this movie going to work in terms of am I going to be able to pay my debt with the people that gave me the money? But at the same time, and it's horrible to be in the, I mean, the sensation, the physical sensation of owing money, it's disgusting. So that part worries me, but what frees me from it is that I think the film is a contribution because it's different, because it's unique, you made and something, I'm proud of it. You made something eternal. You, made some, you may be in debt for a couple of years, you may be in debt for 10, you made something that, you made something that will live on forever though. You know, it's, it's more than you at a certain point. And you know what? I hope you're in debt less than that, though. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you, the bankers that gave me some of the money that came from Lebanon said to me, I never thought I would hear myself ever, ever say this, but this has done, because it went to Lebanon first, so much to the spirit, to the broken spirit of this country. It has been so profound that I don't care if we ever make the money back because this is so much more than just about money. So I said, oh, okay, for, <laughs> at least this part. But it's actually done quite well in, in Lebanon, correct? Oh, guys, in Lebanon on the second, this was before it came out, the second weekend, we beat Avengers. <laughs> yes. Our little tiny spiritual film. I love that. I love that this film beat Avengers because I hope for things to beat Avengers all the time because they're just such dominators. But it's amazing that something like this was able able to do it. Congratulations, that's unbelievable. You found another versus. <laughs> uh, we have another question. Hi, over there. Hi. So I work for Makers.com. I don't see you. I don't see you. Over Jump. Here. I promise. I'm over here. Okay. Well, come over there. Oh, get over here, girl. <laughs> So I work for Makers.com, which is the largest collection of women's stories online. And in an article I read, you had mentioned that makers Julie Tamer, Eve Onsler, and Ariane Huffington are among the women who have influenced you. What sort of leadership roles are you taking on in order to continue to influence other women and girls? Well, <laughs> you know, I am passionate about the on that potential on, of women, I am excited for the world because it's in such bad condition, but it's only used half of its potential. It's really not investigated the wonders of the other half because even the women that get into power, we don't really know who we are because we have been for so for history, trying to fit in and be accepted by systems that are created by men. Sorry. It's okay. I know you've tried your best. <laughs> and look where it's got us. Yeah, we screwed up. <laughs> no, no. No, it's great. But also, it's, it must be exciting also for men. What can be our contribution? So, I... I I try to look inside of myself also, not just talk about it. What can I do? What can I do different? Hence the movie. But um, I don't think of myself, I wake up and think, oh, I am the inspiration of the other women. I never think about that. I think about us growing together and fig figuring it out together. And I see so many other women like Julie or Ariana or Eve, but I work on the field. And a lot of my greatest inspirations come from the everyday women that I have to work with that are so courageous. Absolutely. Do we have a, another question? Hola, Salma. Soy Mexicana también. I'm going to have to translate this one. <laughs> No, um, I just wanted to ask you, are you spiritual or religious? Because I know 
this film could have only been done by someone who's closely connected to their spirit. It seems like a beautiful film. Also, I love your stilettos. <laughs> Sergio Rossi. Um, I am spiritual. I, I did grow up Catholic, and I still embrace a lot of the wonderful uh, principles of Catholicism. Uh, but I am, I feel my best relationship with, with God, in any way you want to name it, has been when we have a personal relationship that doesn't go through rules established by someone else. It's not an institution. Um, I, so in my particular case, and I was very, very lucky to be raised Catholic, I feel that most of us believe in the things we were taught to believe in. We were told to believe in. I think you are closest to God when you find the courage to find who you are. Because life is a gift, and he gave it to you. And you have to make the best contribution to this time with your life. But for this, you have to, I believe that for me to be curious about who am I and, and what is this, and to go try to find him on my own, created the closest relationship to him. Did you find that for yourself after you reached a certain amount of success? I know for some people, success uh, when you're young becomes the first thing. You get very driven and obsessive about that. And then once you reach it, that's when you sort of start questioning, okay, well, who, who actually am I now that I've attained this? No, no. I don't, I don't know that I've reached an immense amount of success yet. It's always been sort of like a struggle. But I think we all have the question... Uh, and then we sometimes feel guilty just to have the question. And so it was, it, I don't associate in any way uh, spirituality with success. And I didn't feel like looking for spirituality as a response for guilt of success. Like I never... I was an activist way before I was an actress. And I think sometimes in looking to, to help others or feel like we are all one, it's also another way to find spirituality. Absolutely. In love. We have uh, more questions? Hi, I'm here from uh, representing the Lebanese American University. Uh, my husband is Lebanese. I lived in Lebanon for several years. I'm not Lebanese, but I have a little half uh, Lebanese child. So it's great that you are promoting the country through this film. Um, in Hollywood, we often don't see very positive portrayals of Arabs, um, which is unfortunate. Why do you think it's a good thing to promote not only um, a positive story of, of, a, of a wonderful Arab man, but also the arts, you know, to show that Arabs are not just um, violent people, but are artists, writers, and um, many people might not connect the fact that this book that is, as you mentioned, so famous around the world to many different cultures and people is in fact written by an Arab and that some of our greatest works of... Who was also an artist. He was also a painter and a right. lot of his yeah. art is also included in, in the film. So yeah, why do you think it's important to raise those voices and did you have any uh, trouble raising those voices in Hollywood? <laughs> okay. Um, you know, when you say I want to make a philosophy book into a movie, and then you say it's going to be, it's actually poetry, and then <laughs> it gets worse. And then you say, no, 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 but listen, I want to make it into animation, and they go, right. No, no, but it's very important because it was written by an Arab writer, writer this philosophy, and then they kick you out of the office at this point. So, yes, it did not, it did not help that part. Um, I think I forgot all the other questions. Just yes, I think in general, art, it's the mu art, music, art, poetry, the, the magic of 
cinema and the way we tell our stories through images and through putting all this together. It's a door that is very, very direct to hearts. And I think that, again, these are the things that, where the, the points where we all come together. And like I said before, it's important that we don't have preconceived notions of this or of that or Arabs or, you know, our, you know, Afro-Americans, all kinds. It's not just Arabs or this. What was wonderful about the book and about him is that he doesn't do the separation. So we make this universal movie that it's reminding people also that it's showing a different side of this world, the Arab world, that we kind of just see one face of it here in America. You use the word preconceived, the words preconceived notions, and I think it's so interesting when you talk about the movie industry not responding to this because the movie industry is mainly made up of preconceived notions, you know? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. One more question I think we have time for. They have a preconceived notion of the audience. They do think, I'm sorry, but this is important. They do think, I'm sorry, but that the majority of the people are not smart, or that the men are not sensitive. They're incredibly disrespectful to the youth of America. The things, the content for youth is pitiful. These are the future of, of, of the world. They are abandoned, confused. They, they, a lot of them are profound thinkers. And they develop a lot of anxiety. The same for children. They, they are dumbed down with the content. And, but for the youth, it's very important. You know, I was told, no, we don't want this film. Uh, young people are not interested in philosophy. And, and I was so scared when I heard this because they, they really misunderstand the youth. And this is why ISIS is recruiting them. The young people are looking for a sense of purpose. The young people need to feed their soul. They are looking for, they go hide in little cafes so that secretly they can read their poetry, that they don't want their cool friends to know they wrote. There is not a, you know, this is, I think there is a crisis with content for children and young people in, in the United States, and it's, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Last question. You can stand back up. Thank you. <laughs> Hola, Salma. Hola. I am a Mexican actress. Um, Good I, luck. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, yeah, like you say, it's, it's rough to come from another country and try to make it here in the entertainment industry. And just so you know, you're a huge inspiration, I think, for a lot of actors of Latin America that try to, you know, come here because they have this gut feeling that, you know, it's going to happen. And, well, I'm sure your movie will do incredible. Uh, it's a really nice message, and I think... I'm, I'm glad someone too. is. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's content, and it's soulful, and we're humans, and I think it's great. And my question is, what would be the advice that you would give to young artists that... Are, are not feeling fulfilled by the content that, you know, the industry sort of gives them. Do not waste a lot of energy blaming the industry and being frustrated. Take that energy and that time. Do not feel sorry for yourself. It's a very comfortable place to be a coward. To, to, in, in, to where you can just sit down and say, well, these people are these and that, and they don't want me, like I said. Uh, use this energy to feed your talent with inspiration. Um, do not look at yourself as a victim or the, or the underdog. You, you are very lucky because you don't have any accent, or, and you speak English, or at least my accented ear doesn't <laughs> hear it. <laughs> and you are very beautiful, and, and they like that. They, they like pretty in Hollywood. <laughs> but what's important is that 
you believe in yourself and that you continue to feed your talent with inspiration. And that you don't join ISIS. <laughs> that you do not. Yes, yeah. please. There's beautiful Selma, country. Uh, congratulations. Thank you so much for being here. Such a beautiful film. Thank you so much. <laughs> Guys, Selma, how can, how, can people, how can people see the film? My <laughs> accent here is not... A... How, can, how can people see the film? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so it opens. How many theaters do you think it's going to open the first weekend? One in New York and one in LA. That's a win. And we're almost sold out. It opens on Friday. So run and get your tickets in the internet because it's, it's, I promise you it's worth it. I promise you, I guarantee it. If you don't like it and I'm in the street, I give you permission to pull my hair. <laughs> if you ever find me, if you go see this film and I disappoint you, if you ever find me, you have my permission to put, but don't take it off, huh? <laughs> but you can, you can do something, I don't know. So if you guys see Selma aimlessly walking through the streets getting her hair pulled, don't worry, it's part of the marketing plan of the movie. <laughs> We're all good. Selma, thank you so much. Thank you.